your surrender. First John chapter 5 verses 1 through 4. And the word of God today from the King James text reads, Whosoever believeth that Jesus Christ is the Christ is born of God. And every one that loveth him that beget, loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Hallelujah. Again, my topic today is never surrender. Amen. If you'll bow your heads with me one more time. Father, we come humbly before you today, God, acknowledging your greatness and at the same time acknowledging our smallness. Lord, we need you. If ever the people of God, if ever the church has needed you, we need you today. Especially the church in America. Master, we do not consider ourselves a fringe movement. We do not consider ourselves somewhere out on the outer edges of the church. But we understand, God, that we are fully and completely members of the body of Christ. And as members of the body of Christ, we are concerned not only with our own health and our own well-being, but we are concerned with the health and well-being of the entire church, international and universal. Master, we need the anointing of the Holy Ghost, God. I've been preaching your word for 30 some odd years and Lord, I would never be so great a fool as to think that I have some talent or some gift that allows me to deliver the word of God in a fashion that brings you honor and glory and causes fruit to sprout in the lives of your people. I understand today, God, that all I can do is the best I can do. But the anointing of the Holy Ghost makes all the difference. Anoint my mind, my lips of clay. Anoint the ear of every hearer. Prepare our hearts today, Lord, to receive from you. For I believe, God, you've given me a word for your people. Therefore, this is not a word from Pastor Charles. This is a word from the Lord. Help us all to receive it with gladness and with thanksgiving. Lord, that it might become engrafted upon the tablet of our heart. And that we might leave this place living what we've heard and not hearing. And then quickly forgetting. We ask it all in that precious name, Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. Never surrender. I know a lot of times people hear the sermon title that I have given my message. And then I give the text, then I read the primary text. And they're looking at me like, how in the world did you ever get that title out of that, you know, out of that text? Well, I've tried to explain to people for many years that God called me to a prophetic ministry. That does not mean you're always going to be standing around with your eyes rolling around in your head talking in tongues and prophesying. That is not what prophetic ministry means. I know many people have been 
uh, wrongly educated within the Pentecostal movement, within the Spirit-filled church, and that is what they seem to think prophetic ministry means. Prophetic ministry simply means that you preach, thus saith the Lord. I represent every message that I preach as a word that I have received from God. And I believe with every ounce of my being that every sermon I've ever preached, I received from God for His people for that hour. I cannot tell you how many times I have been given a word from the Lord and I've thought to myself, Lord, what in the world? Why in the world would you give me that message for this Sunday? I, I don't get it. I... It, it just, to me, it seems so out of place. To me, it seemed so misplaced. And yet, I would preach it. And all of a sudden, I would, we'd wind up having visitors in that service. First time visitors. Never been in our church before. And they would come to me after the service. We had one lady one time, Cynthia. She came to me after the service. She had brought a friend to church and she said, there were four topics, there were four issues that my friend and I were discussing in the car as we were coming to visit your church tonight. She said there were four specific things that we talked about in the car coming to church. She said, and don't you know you literally hit on and answered every single one of those questions. Now that has to be God. Only God can give me a message days in advance for questions they're not even going to ask until Sunday. Mm -hmm. But do you follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Prophetic ministry is not about prophesying in the sense of uh, you know, prophecy. Now, there are times that I operate in the gift of prophecy, yes. But prophetic ministry is something different. You see, the Word of God said in the last days, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. You can prophesy under the anointing of the Holy Ghost and not be a prophet. Right. Just because you prophesy does not make you a prophet. Hello now. Any more than speaking German when you talk in tongues makes you German. No. But prophetic ministries, when you declare the say of the Lord, say, all right, well, I understand that. You're trying to explain to me, Pastor, how come you give certain titles to certain texts? Okay, I'm getting there. Take, you know me, folks. Takes me a minute sometimes. The title has to do with the, the message that God has given me, and the text only helps to point us in the right direction, okay? So the title and the text may not be directly correlated. Now let me get into this message. Prime Minister Winston Churchill, as you see pictured in the illustration, behind me gave a speech to the English Parliament on the 4th of June 1940 following the evacuation of troops from Dunkirk. Many of you may have seen the recent movie about the evacuation of the troops at Dunkirk. Having to evacuate those troops was a major military defeat. And it made it appear as though England was having to backpedal and England was having to pull back. And perhaps it was the beginning of the end for England and it was the beginning of a final victory over the UK for Adolf Hitler. But after that evacuation, Winston Churchill gave a speech to Parliament 
that shattered any illusion that the evacuation of troops from Dunkirk had turned a military defeat into a victory for the enemy. On the 4th of June, 1940, Winston Churchill spoke to the House of Commons and he declared, even though large tracts of Europe and many old and famous states have fallen or may fall into the grip of the Gestapo and all the odious apparatus of Nazi rule, we shall not flag or fail. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. <laughs> oh, I'm going to tell you, they give Winston Churchill a lot of credit. Historians give Sir Winston Churchill a great deal of credit for keeping his nation unified and encouraged in the face of some of the worst odds and some of the worst circumstances that any nation could ever face. To hear Mr. Churchill speak, I am too young to have heard him speak. I know some of y'all think that isn't the case, but I am. But I'll tell you, I watched some of the videos of his old speeches and all, and my goodness, I'm going to tell you, that man could send chills up your spine. He would get on the radio, and he would deliver a speech to the nation while bombs were falling on London while the Germans were beating the English back and tearing up their countryside and destroying large portions of their city. And Sir Winston Churchill would get on the radio and he would deliver a speech that would rile up and rouse and encourage the English people until they were going to fight till every man was dead if they had to. But by no means, under any circumstances, were they ever going to surrender to the Nazi and the tyrant and the dictator that was Adolf Hitler? Many in the church today have come to believe that the way of God, the way that God has prescribed for believers to overcome and win in this life is inadequate. It's insufficient. Many in the church have come to believe that. Right now in America, we are seeing evangelical and fundamentalist churches by the thousands surrendering to the spirit of Antichrist. Uh -huh. Say, oh, pastor, they're just misled. Oh, pastor, they're just not acting right. No, they have surrendered to the spirit of Antichrist. Let's call this thing what it is. Yes. If you're not preaching God's way, then you're preaching against God. If you're not preaching what the Word of God tells us to do, and if you're not instructing God's people to do things, the way God has prescribed for us to do them, if you're preaching any other message or any other way or any other method, then my friend, you have been influenced by the spirit of Antichrist. That's the truth. The word of God tells us that even before the apostles were dead, the apostles warned that the spirit of Antichrist was already in the world. And it was already working. 
It was already trying to persuade believers to look past God's ways, to look past God's provisions, to look past the instruction that God gave us, and to look toward a carnal answer, a man-made answer, an answer that satisfied the flesh rather than satisfied God. And I've got news for you today, folks. Many <clears throat> in the church today, especially in America, but it's not just true in America. It's true in nations around the world. Many have surrendered to the spirit of Antichrist. They're adopting mindsets and they're adopting ways that are completely contradictory to the mindset and the ways that God would have us to embrace. We've got preachers, as I preached a few weeks ago, we've got preachers who are calling for believers to arm themselves and prepare to go to the streets and fight a war in order to exercise their influence upon our society, upon our culture, and upon our government. Rome did this for centuries. Yep. Many people don't understand us apostolics, but y'all don't believe everything the way most churches believe it. You don't accept this doctrine or that doctrine, even though it's traditional within the church today, and most churches accept this doctrine or that doctrine. Well, I'm all well and good with them adopting and believing those things if they want to. The only problem is, I know enough about history to know that the church wouldn't believe half of those things today if Rome didn't have the power of the state behind them for centuries. That's true. If Rome wasn't boiling people in oil who would not confess and profess to believe the things that Rome told them they were to believe. If Rome was not tying people's arms and legs to four horses and then slapping the horses on the backside and having these people's bodies pulled asunder because they would not surrender and believe the things that Rome told them they were to believe. There are many doctrines in many churches today and honey I got news for you is it's as true of many Protestant churches as it is the Catholic or the Episcopal Church. There are many doctrines, even in Protestant churches, that were born in Rome and are completely contradictory to everything the apostles ever taught, everything the apostles ever said. Completely contradictory. I'll give you one quick example. Jesus himself said, Call no man father, but your father which is in heaven. He was not speaking of the head of the family. He was not speaking of the man who contributed to your birth. He was speaking of spiritual leaders. He said, you do not call any spiritual man father. You have only one father, and that father is God. Now the Roman church comes along, and for centuries they have taught that everyone in the church is to address the priest as father. Am I telling the truth? Yep. It's in complete and total contradiction to what Jesus Christ the Lord himself said. And yet they teach it. We've got churches in America, churches around the world, who are encouraging their members to take up arms and prepare themselves for battle. When the Word of God says plainly, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The Word of God clearly says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. 
Jesus himself said, if you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. Yet for all of these biblical admonitions, we have Christians who are arming themselves and who are literally getting riled up into a frenzy, preparing themselves. Oh, if Donald Trump gets impeached, we're going to go to war. And that is completely contradictory to everything the Word of God teaches. It is completely contradictory to everything that God would have for His people. But we're afraid to say that these people have surrendered to the spirit of Antichrist. Mm -hmm. Well, if I'm going to operate in the prophetic, if I'm going to do the job God's called me to do, if I'm going to declare it, thus saith the Lord, then I'm going to let you know right now that is exactly what they've done. I'm also going to tell you today, I will not surrender to the modern movements which call for compromise. I refuse to surrender my faith in the Word of God and in His call for love and faith as the ingredients necessary to overcome all obstacles. I will never surrender. Hallelujah. I'm going to do things God's way. We're going to do things God's way. we got to make up our mind today that we're going to do things God's way. And the spirit of Antichrist can knock and knock and knock on the door. But our response will always be, I will never surrender. Hallelujah. Martin Luther King Jr. preached a message of love and nonviolence. He faced some of the most violent adversaries. And yet, in the face of violence, he maintained his position. Many in the church today are surrendering to the enemy and adopting the satanic belief that fear, carnality, Anger and hatred are more powerful than faith and love. But that is not what our primary text told us today. Our primary text told us today, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. You cannot claim to love God and not do what God has commanded us to do. You're just a liar. You've sold yourself out to some fib. You've sold yourself out to a lie if you believe that you can claim to love God and yet conduct yourself in a manner that is completely contradictory to everything God has instructed us to live. Amen. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. Listen. And His commandments are not grievous. <sighs> when you love somebody, you do what makes them happy. When you love somebody and you do what makes them happy, doing what makes them happy, listen to me now, does not make you unhappy. He said when you love God, you do His commandments, you keep His commandments. He said, and the commandments of God are not grievous. How do you know you love God? Well, you love God, you know you love God when you do what God asks you to do. And doing what He's asked you to do doesn't make you unhappy to do it. If you're miserable getting up on Sunday morning to go to church, if you're miserable reading your Bible or praying, if you're miserable doing the things that God has taught us and told us to do, if you're grumping and griping about it, many of us remember when we were children 
and mom and dad would be preparing us on Sunday to go to church. Now I can tell you honestly, I've loved the Lord since I was so young, I can barely remember anything different. But I had brothers. <coughs> oh, they'd gripe and grow, I don't want to go to church, I don't want to. And my mother said, get yourself in that room and get yourself ready. Oh, and Michael would just be <coughs> stomping around. He'd be so unhappy. And boy, I mean, he would just drag his feet. He was in no hurry to get ready for church. Why? Because he hadn't come to the place in his life yet where he loved the Lord. Because when you get to the place in your life where you love the Lord, then the commandments of God are no longer grievous. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? We got churches full of people today who are following leaders and preachers and false prophets down paths that completely contradict everything the Word of God teaches us. Why? Because doing it God's way makes them miserable. God says we're not supposed to be violent. God says we're supposed to fight our battles on our knees. God says we're supposed to fight our battles in the prayer closet. God says that our battles are spiritual, they're not carnal. God says that we've got to accept every circumstance and every situation as being his perfect and divine will because he's in charge even when we don't want to believe or even when we don't understand he's in charge. But I'm not happy with that. I'm going to do it another way. Oh, honey, you've just told me two things. Number one, you've told me you don't love the Lord. Because you can't love the Lord and not keep His commandments. Am I telling the truth? Right. And the fact that His commandments make you miserable is further proof that you don't love the Lord. And number two, you've sold your soul to the spirit of Antichrist. Because approaching anything in a manner that is the opposite of what Christ has taught us, what the Lord has taught us, is to embrace the instruction and the methods of the Antichrist. My Lord, have mercy. Matthew chapter 10, verses 16 through 22. Jesus said, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless, and harmless as doves. I've never heard of one person being killed because they were attacked by a dove. I've heard of people being attacked by eagles. I've heard of animals and people being attacked by hawks. I've heard of animals and people being attacked by any number of birds of prey, but honey, a dove is not on the list of birds of prey. The Spirit of the Lord at the Lord's baptism descended from heaven appearing to John the Baptist in the form of a dove. He didn't come to pick John's brains out. The dove was a symbol of comfort. The dove was a symbol of peace. Am I telling the truth today? Yep. The Lord continues in verse 17, Matthew 10, But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour 
what ye shall speak. Isn't it funny? The Lord said, I don't even want you to prepare words in advance. I don't even want you to prepare a speech in advance. Never mind, I don't want you to prepare uh, packing guns and putting weapons aside to fight. Hello now. Mm -hmm. Said even when it comes to what you say and how you say it, when you stand before these leaders, Said, I don't want you to even prepare in advance. Said, listen, he said, but well, when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death. And the father, the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Listen. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. What is the Lord saying? He is saying, never surrender. Amen. You've got to endure to the end. You've got to keep your faith. You've got to keep living it God's way. You've got to keep doing it God's way. You've got to keep believing it God's way. In spite of any circumstance, in spite of any torment or tribulation that may come your way, oh God, help us to be a people today who are committed to your will and your way. Help us, Lord, to never surrender. In verse 4 of our primary text, John wrote to the church, For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So honey, if you surrender your faith, you are no longer overcoming the world, but you become a part of it. Yes. We've got millions in America today who have sold their souls to the spirit of Antichrist. They're adopting ways that are completely contradictory to the ways of God. They're no longer happy doing God's way, God's will, and doing it in God's way. They're, it no longer pleases them to do things the way God has ordained that they ought to be done. And therefore, they have surrendered their faith, and in so doing, they have become subjects in the kingdom of the Antichrist. In Romans chapter 12, verses 8 through 18, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Well, how do you serve the Lord? <laughs> you don't serve the Lord doing things your way, honey. That's not how it works. When you're serving somebody, you're doing what they ask you to do, and you're doing it the way they ask you to do it. Verse 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. 
Let me repeat that. Recompense or repay no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. That is God's commandment. That is the teaching of Christ. That is the Word of God. That is God's way. And anybody that preaches a way different than that is operating under the influence of the spirit of Antichrist. And anybody who is not willing to live this way and to approach things in this fashion, my friend, anybody who finds themselves disgruntled and unhappy trying to obey that commandment from the Lord <coughs> has lost their love line to Jesus. Word of God said in the book of Revelation, one of the churches, he said that they had lost their first love. They no longer felt, they no longer had that love connection that they first had when they came into relationship with the Lord. There are a lot of Christians in the church today. There are a lot of believers in the church today who have lost their love connection with the Lord. They no longer <coughs> love Him as perhaps they once did. And this is what has facilitated their surrender to the spirit of Antichrist. Galatians 5, 13 through 18. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, or in one sentence in this case, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And I've got news for you today. That includes your gay neighbor. I've got news for you today. That includes your alcoholic neighbor. I've got news for you today. That includes your drug addict neighbor. I've got news for you today. That includes your Mexican neighbor and your Asian neighbor. That includes your black neighbor. That includes your Hispanic neighbor. That includes your Asian neighbor. Honey, there is no exception to the rule. That's right. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. <coughs> but if ye bite and devour one another, listen, Take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. What's Paul saying? He's saying you better be mindful of how you do things because if you start approaching things from a carnal perspective, honey, guess what? You're going to reap what you've sown. You're not going to get something back. You know, I, I, I have to laugh when I see people on Fox News and others talking about how Donald J. Trump is one of the most hated men in the world and he is the most hated president in American history. And boy, they don't understand it. Really? You don't understand it? I sure do. It, it don't come as a surprise to me at all. He's the most carnal man I've ever seen in my life. And when you sow carnality, you reap carnality. He's the most hateful man I've ever seen in my life. When you sow hate, you reap hate. Hello now. Am I telling the truth? Every other word off that man's lips is hateful. Every other word off that man's lips is malicious. Every other word off that man's lips is carnal and evil and wicked. What do you expect him to reap? 
You expect everybody to fall at his feet and love him? I'm going to tell you something. People try to say, I think he's the Antichrist. Oh, honey, he couldn't be further from the Antichrist. Donald Trump is nowhere near being the Antichrist. Nowhere near it. The Antichrist, according to the Word of God, is going to have the ability to be so deceptive that he will even be able to deceive the Jewish nation. He's going to be a charmer. He's going to be able to charm the socks off a centipede. Donald Trump is anything but a charmer. The man says things that makes people's blood curl. He's hateful. He's divisive. He's mean-spirited. He's malicious. He's violent. What do you think he's going to reap? That's why Paul said, but if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one another. You better watch what you sow, honey. Because the law of God is such that it cannot be compromised. What you put in is what you're going to pull out. If all you are is hateful, you're going to reap hate. If all you are is mean-spirited, all you're ever going to get from people in return is mean-spiritedness. Am I telling the truth now? This I say then, Paul continues in verse 16, Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. We've got millions of Christians today who have been convinced that they can walk after the flesh and still be a believer. No, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Because when you walk after the flesh, I'm going to tell you something, the, the things that you ought to be doing of the Spirit, you're not capable of doing. You can't do the right thing when you're busy doing the wrong. You can't feed the poor while you're robbing the bank. Am I telling the truth? Right. You follow what I'm trying to tell you today? Right. He said, but if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. There is only one end that can come today from surrendering the truths of our faith and embracing the falsehoods of carnal thinking, fleshly reasoning, and less than spiritual justifications. God's laws cannot be scoffed at or ignored because to do so guarantees only one singular outcome. Galatians 6, 7 through 9. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Paul finishes verse 9, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. What is the Word of God telling us in Galatians? Never surrender. Never give in to the flesh. Never yield to the spirit of Antichrist. Never allow the enemy to convince you that the faith of God in Christ Jesus is insufficient. That it doesn't work. Never let the devil convince you that love is less powerful than hate. That carnality 
is more effective than spirituality. And I tell the truth today. Yes. I'm going to tell you, I'm trying to close up right now. Folks, I'm going to tell you, I, and, and I believe this is from God. It's a word from God, prophetic. I couldn't sleep the other night. I was so troubled in my spirit that I could not sleep because I've been putting on Facebook. See, I don't put everything on my Facebook profile. I have groups that I've created and I share on some of those groups because I don't want to constantly share certain things on my Facebook profile. With the impeachment looming of Donald Trump, I want to tell you folks, I've been trying to warn you for many, many years, we are about to see violence in this country like we've never seen before. I've been saying it prophetically for years. I believe we're going to begin to see domestic terrorism. Something akin to what Ireland and England experienced back in the 70s at the height of the IRA. If you remember the Irish Republican Army fighting against England and they would often blow up buses and they would blow up restaurants and they had suicide bombers who would go in and, and uh, blow themselves up as well as dozens and dozens of people. And it seemed like every day you were hearing of these kinds of incidents in England and in its territories. And I've got news for you today. That type of violence is coming to America. We've always had peaceful government. We've always had peaceful transitioning of power and of administrations. But the man that is now occupying the White House is demented. He is delusional. He is narcissistic to a degree that is so dangerous. I said it before and I'll say it again. He should never have been allowed for one second to walk into the Oval Office. Not for one second. Because the minute he put on the mantle of president, he possessed too much power and he was able to do too many things that he should never have access to. He doesn't have the scruples. He doesn't have the morality. He does not have the integrity of, that a man needs in order to be un, entrusted with that office. Now we see him blowing dog whistles. And I'm going to tell you folks, he is calling for the execution of Adam Schiff. He is calling for the execu execution of Nancy Pelosi. He is calling for the execution of that one young Hispanic new congresswoman and the other ladies that uh, of color. Donald Trump is blowing a dog whistle. I recognize what he's doing because for years I've been prophesying that this was coming. And I mean long before Donald Trump ran for president, it might tell the truth. Yep. I was saying before Trump ran for president, I was saying, after Obama leaves office, all hell's going to break loose. I said, and I'm not sure when it's all said and done and when the smoke has settled, I'm not sure that our democracy will not have been lost and we will be in the grips of a full-blown dictatorship. I've been saying that since long before, long before 2016 elections. So as this stuff is happening now, I'm looking at it from a very different perspective. I'm looking at it from the perspective of, I've been expecting this, I've been looking for this for many, many, many years. So now as I'm seeing certain things happen, I'm already knowing what the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me was coming. So I'm listening and I'm watching and I'm saying, uh-oh, I see what's going on, I see what's happening, I see what this guy's up to. 
Things are going to get far worse before they get better. And as this circumstance decays, as our nation goes through the trouble that we're about to go through, we're going to have a choice to make. Are we going to continue to do things God's way? Or are we going to allow the circumstances of our time to cause us to surrender? to the spirit of Antichrist? Are we going to allow our spirit to lose and our flesh to win? Are we going to allow ourselves to be convinced that hate is more powerful than love? All I can tell you today is I made up my mind with the help and grace of God that I personally will never surrender. Hello now. And I call upon you today, believer, make up your mind and declare in the hearing of the enemy right now, I will never surrender. I will hold fast to my faith. I will hold fast to the commandment of God. I will love and not hate. I will do things spiritually and not carnally. Hello now. Never surrender. Would you stand with me this afternoon?